this is Joshua Cook with BenSwan.com, and I'm here with Steve French. He is uh, running as a Libertarian candidate for governor, South Carolina governor. Uh, so, uh, Steve, the first question I have is what made you uh, want to jump in? Now, you're a business, you're a business guy. I'm you have a family. Yep. And, uh, you know, what, what made you, uh, you jump into the, such an important race? Well, it was a number of things. I think like most people, uh, over time things build up. Obviously, being a small business owner, I understand how the regulations affect a small business. And when I got involved, it was to actually grow a business, not to sit in front of a desk all day and figure out ways of trying to comply with the tax system and the regulation system. So that already was a huge heartburn for me. But I think uh, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was when my son was born this past October. And just seeing what kind of state and what kind of country he's being born into. I think being young, it's a lot easier to just kind of keep your head down and just go on about your day. But the moment you kind of realize that it, you know, it is about the children, especially when it's your children, you start realizing, like, wait a second here, my child hasn't had any say in where this tax money is going. Why should he be the one that's indebted? And it's really, in my, in my view, pathetic that I'm the one sitting there at the pediatrician and at the OBGYN looking at all these fresh faces of children being born and shaking my head just being like they don't even understand what's coming and what they have uh, just on their backs right now. I mean, every child that's born in this country has a $50,000 price tag to them for just the national debt where it's at. Uh, so I think that was uh, one of the biggest factors on top of just we've seen where all the waste, fraud, abuse, and corruption. And uh, it's kind of like that old saying, you know, everybody kind of says somebody should do something, and then you look in the mirror and realize I'm somebody. So it was time for me to, uh, it was a good time in our life, and I just decided that this was the time to go ahead and step up and at least put that face out there that says, you know what, South Carolina, you actually do have a choice now. You don't have to pick your poison. You don't have to be like, well, you know, I'm fiscally conservative, but I'm socially liberal. So, you know, I can't vote for a Republican, but I can't vote for a Democrat. So then what do I do? And most of them, I would say, just don't even vote, which in this state in 2010, we had more people that didn't vote than did. So that to me showed a huge opportunity that there's a lot of people out there that aren't seeing their representatives represent their interests. You know, uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of frustration, too, with uh, some of the Tea Party folks, sure. uh, some of the uh, uh, physically conservative uh, voters out there. Of course, Lindsey Graham uh, mm -hmm. won the nomination, and uh, a lot of people are frustrated. They're actually looking at, um, at Victor Kosher uh, right now yeah. as, you know, stepping out and voting for a libertarian for the first time in their life. You know, they've been Republicans, but they're, they're sick of the system. Also, a lot of Democrats are really sick. I mean, because really, let's look at Nikki Haley and let's look at Vincent Shaheen. Are they really that different? Well, I, I would say absolutely not. And that's the first thing I bring up when people talk about, well, you know, if I vote for you, my vote may quote unquote be wasted. Mm -hmm. And all I do is say, let's just look at the data. You know, what have we had in the past four years? Have we had more government or less government? Have we had more taxes or less taxes? Again, we just had the largest state budget in our state history get passed. So, you know, yes, Vincent Shaheen, he's open for uh, expanding Medicaid. Nikki Haley may say she's not, but yet we're still growing Medicaid at the fastest rate of any other state. So if we can show folks that it doesn't matter, you can vote for a Democrat, you can vote for Republican, you can even vote for Tom Irvin. My argument is you're going to get the same thing you've gotten. None of them are talking about the things we're talking about. And I believe that if we stay very fiscally conservative, talk about a zero income tax, talk about smaller government, but at the same time be able to include people from the gay, lesbian, LGBT movement, talk about decriminalization of marijuana, we can get that fiscal conservatism across to people that normally will never, never vote Republican. Uh Let's talk about crony capitalism. Uh, a lot of people, uh, they, you know, they say, well, look, Nikki Haley is, is bringing jobs. And, of course, you had that tire company that they just um, basically gave millions of dollars of, of uh, sure. tax money to get them to, to come to the South Carolina. Sure. Um, a lot of people point to BMW as a case study of why we need to Bowling. give all the incentives. Uh, what is, the, um, what is the, the problem with that, that type of thinking? Well, I think when anybody hears a politician talk about business investment, <laughs> that should be the first notion for their ears to perk up because uh, I don't think it's government's role to pick winners and losers. Uh, I didn't hear anywhere in college, I never heard anywhere in my business classes, anywhere growing up, that a business 
became profitable and sustainable based on government money. And I think it goes against everything this country was founded on, that public dollars would be given to private entities based on the whims of whatever legislature's in office. And I think a bigger argument to be made about that is, you know, when anybody talks about an investment, what is the key to a, a solid investment? Diversification. So that goes against everything by a quote-unquote sound investment to begin with. So, I mean, I can make the case for the Charleston Restaurant Association. I mean, they employ way more people than Boeing. They employ way more people than BMW probably combined, but they're not getting any tax breaks either. So what, if it's really about jobs, then, it, you know, you can show where it's, it's really not. It's all about them picking winners and losers, and it's about the fact that I understand, yes, we want to bring jobs here, but I think a bigger argument is what kind of state are we? We need to make this the most competitive state there is because where, where else are they going to go? Texas, Florida. So if we can make South Carolina that state to where they would never want to go anywhere else, we're going to get those jobs anyway without needing one single incentive. Now, a lot of... Um and I've heard it argued by especially uh, Senator Shane Martin, who, who said, look, you know, when you give all these tax incentives and you give uh, these, these uh, sweetheart deals to Boeing, you know, it, it basically takes money out of the general fund. But yet we can't pass school choice. It's the same type of money. Well, so what's your, what would your plan as governor or what would you do as a leader to make sure that uh, that issue, because um, the bottom line is people want school choice, um, real school choice. What will you do as governor to make sure that happens in South Carolina? Well, I'm going to do a couple things. Um, one, I think it goes back to our budget. Um, I would ask anybody out there, what have we gotten in South Carolina since 2010 that you couldn't live without? We had a $20 billion budget in 2010. We had a $25 billion budget now. And my point by saying that is it is all about getting rid of the income tax to begin with because that first off puts money in people's pockets. If you have money, if you have wealth, you have school choice already. So that's not even a question. It's about those folks that don't have the money, that don't have the means, that don't have the way of, of getting that kind of choice. So for me, it's very simple to go back, just say, hey, what have we gotten this past four years? I think the, the vast majority of folks would say there isn't anything they've gotten in the past four years if they can even name something that they couldn't live without. So we can go ahead and put the income tax, get rid of it. That takes care of that part right there. It's paid for. We just go back to 2010 spending levels. On top of that, I think that we should get rid of departments of commerce when they have a $45 million slush fund. It's a $45 million fund of our tax money that's just going out, again, to the government picking winners and losers. So my argument again is, why are these people the ones picking the winners? Why shouldn't I be able to say, well, you know what, I, I, why, am I, why are my restaurants getting, you know, getting help then? I mean, they go under just as much as any other business. And the point behind that is, we don't need it. The government should not be involved in that. So if I can first off get more disposable income back to families, that's going to help first off. Secondly, I think that school choice movement is one of those bridge gap uh, uh, movements right now. There's a lot of Democrats that are all about school choice. Um, I've talked to some of the superintendents that are floored by the fact that the Democratic Party is all about food vouchers. They're for health vouchers. They're for house vouchers. But the moment you bring up school vouchers, it's, it's a non-starter. So I think there's enough of the Democrats on that side that would actually be able to come over. My argument, though, again, is that the Republicans can't do it because it has come down to a point in politics where it's about the winners. It's not about whose idea it is anymore, or it is, that's, that's all it is. It's not about a good idea, it's about whose idea is it. So we can't have this be an idea from the Republicans because then it looks like, oh, we're going to let the Republicans win. We can't let the Democrats do this because that's a Democratic idea. Well, as a third-party libertarian candidate, I can come in there and say, it doesn't matter whose idea. I don't care if it's a Democrat or Republican idea. Is it a good idea? And if it's a good idea, then how do we move that idea forward? And I think school choice is one of those perfect examples where there is enough consensus between both parties that right now I feel like they're fighting just on the party lines, whereas if we get somebody new, fresh, that doesn't have these same kind of stigmas, it kind of takes away that, that whole idea and just saying, you know what, well, hey, I, you know, libertarian third-party candidate's going to push this. It's no longer a Republican or no longer a Democratic idea. That's why I've, I've talked about a lot of things like decriminalization of marijuana that again bridges both sides of the aisle I think those are perfect issues to be able to get passed through right now in our time here in South Carolina because enough people on both sides of the aisle really want to push for things like that what's your thoughts on the health care you know there was a bill that uh, would open up the competition where uh, insurance companies would be able to come in 
uh, to South Carolina, so it would cross state lines. Like Massey. So, that's right, and uh, you know, it seems like you have a, a major, like the, the largest lobbyist is Blue Cross Blue Shield Absolutely. in South Carolina. So what's your ideas? How can we make uh, health care, bring it down and make it affordable, really affordable for South Carolinians? Well, in any uh, question about affordability and cost, it all comes down to competition. That's why I fully support uh, Mr. Massey's bill. I find it uh, very disheartening, uh, just like Katrina Shealy's income tax bill, that our governor has not gotten behind certain bills that are already primed and ready in our state legislature to get passed. Now, on top of that, we know that Medicaid is going to be a huge issue. By 2020, it is going to take over a third of this state's budget. So we have to start talking about this issue. Now, I would talk to Democrats that are all about this Medicaid expansion, keep talking about free money. There is nothing free. I don't think anybody sits there and says there's just free money given out. And being a business owner, I can tell you that when I know that something's bankrupt or a business is about to go under, I stop giving them business because I know they can't pay for it. Our federal government's broke. $17 trillion in debt, folks, that's, that's what it is. So why am I going to give an IOU to the federal government saying, oh, it's free, you can pay our state back? It's only a matter of time before they can't. And when they can't, that's when it's going to bankrupt the state. So we have to start talking to these folks that the Medicaid isn't like a lottery ticket, like, oh my gosh, I've won the lottery by getting on Medicaid. It's actually the opposite. I would argue that Medicaid is probably one of the worst things. Uh, when it comes to just doling out services and being able to provide quality health care, um, it's more of an income argument. We need to talk to folks about raising them out of poverty so you know what, you can afford your own private health coverage insurance. I think there's uh, some good arguments being floated out there. Uh, with There's a lot of retired doctors right now that would love to start their own practice. The whole reason they can't do that is because of malpractice insurance. Now, that goes back to tort reform, but I think there is maybe some role for the state to be able to come in there and take some of that burden off as a pool by the state saying, you know what, if you're a retired doctor and you want to open your own clinic, we can help you do that and we can pull it with all these other doctors in this state. On top of that, I think we really need to talk about the home health care issue. Uh, when you're talking about being in your 70s, 80s, uh, and end-of-life care, Medicaid is not a financially viable option. We know that it is way more expensive for someone to be in Medicaid at end of life care. So we need to be talking about, okay, what are the ways that we can keep people in their homes? We know it's cheaper. We know most of the time they stay healthier being in their homes. So if we focus on home health care as opposed to just opening up Medicaid you know, for all, I think we're going to get a better return on that buck. Uh, but like I said, I think it really comes down to competition, and I'm 100% behind Kent Massey's bill uh, about crossing state lines. And I think it's a matter of time before that happens. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, people in the Republican Party that's really frustrated, as we talked about. What would you say to them? Why should they come out and vote for you uh, November? Well, because... Most Republicans would agree that they're fiscally conservative, so that's why I would go back to what have we gotten that's been fiscally conservative over the past four years. I don't know of one program or one tax that has, has gotten repealed. They're talking about an extra $0.39 cent a gallon gas tax. They're talking about expanding Medicaid. Whether or not they're publicly for it or not, it's still happening. We get more and more regulations, and then we make it harder and harder for the common man to just make a living. And I would ask all Republicans to look at the fruit on the tree. Just look what we've seen. You know, there, there is some very good data out there that shows we are not in a fiscally conservative state. I, I haven't seen it. I don't know if any programs that have been brought back or any kind of regulations that have been brought back, and I know there's no, been no taxes that have been brought back. This thing by Nikki Haley getting rid of the 6% income tax bracket, giving each family $29 a year, uh, it's not just a joke, it's pathetic. I mean, $29 a year isn't helping anybody out. So saying you're a fiscal conservative taking care of the 6% income tax bracket, the fact of the matter is, folks, most of us make over $14,000 a year, which means most of us are in the 7% bracket, so none of us will ever see any, any kind of tax break because of that. So check the data out. Look at what these people are doing. And I think the Libertarian Party is primed and ready to be that consistently philosophical party that is truly fiscally conservative. I'm trying to get rid of the Department of Commerce. I'm trying to talk about, you know, do we need to have the agriculture budget be millions and millions of dollars to promote bar South Carolina barbecue? And I love South Carolina barbecue, but does the state need to come in there and take our hard-earned money to go out there and advertise that? And I would say that's probably not a efficient way of government allocating public resources. Well, you know, and it seems like in other states, uh, a lot of libertarians are really polling very well. 
Sure. And uh, it seems like it's, it's really becoming more popular when people will actually uh, listen to uh, the libertarian message, especially among young people and uh, more of the independent voter. How's your campaign going in? What, what are you doing to it's, reach out to those? It's going uh, great. I mean, it has just started taking off. It, the more and more the people uh, meet me, uh, hear what my policy stances are, and just see what my background and what my, uh, my life has been all about, I think they finally see that I am just a regular guy. I am not a career politician. I'm somebody that has business experience. So first off, I know when to get the wrong people out of those positions, and I know how to put the right people in the right positions, which I would say our governor probably needs some work on there. Um, but that, again, is one of the reasons why I stepped up. I got very tired of so many people my age saying I vote for that, but yet not having somebody to vote for. And when 50% of this state doesn't vote, I would argue that most of them are probably 35, 45 and younger. On top of that, they're probably minorities. So that's the whole point. Nobody in this state, we haven't had a third party candidate since 98. We have not had that choice. So I want to take that excuse away from everybody now saying, well, you know, there's nobody for me to vote for. No, there is somebody you can vote for now. The choice is, are you going to get off the couch and actually do something about it? I'll give you the last words, whatever you want to say. Well, I would ask everybody that's listening to this just to go to FrenchForFreedom.com, check me out on Facebook, uh, watch some of the videos, listen to what I'm saying about the income tax, listen to what I'm saying about school choice, uh, decriminalization, equality and marriage. But folks, it does not matter. All those issues are great issues, but if we don't have transparent, efficient government, it is all for naught. And I think that is the biggest reason why it is time for this state to show and have a referendum on the status quo. And for me, that is what this November's election is about. It's not about just being one person of the legislature. I could have ran for state house or state senate. I think it's time for this entire state to show that we are tired of the status quo and that it's time for us to move into the 21st century, take things over like the income tax. I mean, we've got the data out there. We know that the nine other states that have a zero income tax have created over half the jobs of, this, of the past decade in this past country. We know that school choice is probably one of the biggest ways of getting people out of poverty. So if we know these things, we have to elect people that are firmly, philosophically implanted in that. And I don't see where either Vincent Shaheen, Tom Irvin, or Nikki Haley checks off any of those boxes. So that's why I'm running, and that's what I'm hoping to get across to folks, that there finally is a choice in South Carolina, and it is somebody that's viable, and it is somebody that can make a difference here. Well, see, friends, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.